Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski and I'll be your host for today. We're very excited to be spending the whole week celebrating our ocean. So in partnership with Explorer by the Seat of Your Pants, we have over 50 events that are gonna run all week long with amazing scientists and explorers who do awesome things, studying our oceans, exploring, diving, conservation work, all kinds of, of just great things. So really excited today. We're doing a hangout from the field. Uh, with Joe Cutler. Joe is a National Geographic Explorer, an ichthyologist and conservationist in Central Africa. He served in the Peace Corps as a volunteer in Cameroon and currently works with the Nature Conservancy in Gabon. Over the past four years, Joe has conducted seven fish sampling expeditions, collecting hundreds of fish species, including dozens that are completely new to science. So in a minute, we're going to let Joe take over. and He's going to give us a little tour of the intertidal zone uh, where he is. But first, I'm going to share National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive, and it's going to give us a little picture of where we are uh, and who's joining us today. So if you'll just bear with me for one moment while I share my screen, uh, we'll take a quick look at that MapMaker Interactive. So here we go. Screen should be shared now, and I'm opening the map. So as you can see, uh, if I zoom in a little closer, this is where I'm hosting from just outside of Guelph, Ontario, here in Canada. And if we back out a little bit more, we can get a feel for uh, some of our classrooms joining us. So uh, we have a little fish down here to represent roughly where Joe's joining us today. You can see the beautiful ocean in the background. We've got a classroom in Montana, another in Kamloops. And if I back up a little bit more, we have another classroom up here near the border in Rainy River, near the border of the US and Canada classroom in Illinois, a classroom just joined us in New Jersey today, so I don't have them on the map, but we're excited to have you, and San Antonio. And just to give you a little global perspective, here are some of Joe's sites where he works. If I move across the Atlantic, there's Cameroon, and there's Gabon. So just a little uh, kind of taste of the areas we'll be talking about around the world today. So I think that's enough for me. I'm going to turn things over to Joe. Joe, I know it's a little bit windy, but thank you so much for being out there to give us this little tour today of your world. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm really excited to do so. As you said, you know, I'm a, I'm a National Geographic Explorer and I spend most of my time studying Central Africa. But when I'm not in Africa, I'm here on the Central California coast exploring the intertidal. And it's one of my favorite ecosystems, so I'm really happy to have the chance to explore it with you all. All right, and Joe. That... Go ahead, that... Joe. Oh, sorry. This is going to be tough, too, because it's, it's two Joes, but two Joes are better than one. That's what I hear. So uh, We'll roll with that. Um, so, Joe, like you mentioned, you get to come and do this kind of stuff when you're not working uh, in Africa. And I mentioned that you're near Santa Cruz. But what's your exact location today? I am up uh, on the Central California coast near Davenport, California. It's an old uh, timber town just north of Santa Cruz. Uh, and there's a couple little pocket beaches to my left and right, and I'm on a big uh, rocky spit here uh, where we've got a nice flat rocky intertidal area. All right. Well, I'm ready for a tour, but just before you do take us on the tour, why is this area you are so important, this zone you're in? Why is it such an important area? Yeah, the rocky intertidal is so cool because it's the interface between ocean and land. And where I'm standing right here, actually, would be underwater at a few times during the month. This whole rocky shelf uh, transitions the, with, this is a very low tide right now. So the tide is as far out as it's going to be all month. And as the day goes on, the tide's going to come on shore. And at the highest tides of the month, it'll actually, the water of the ocean will be where I'm standing. So everything from here to the shore is considered the Rocky Intertidal. And it's a really unique ecosystem because you have marine organisms within walking distance at the low tides. So I'm just wearing rain boots right now, but I'm gonna be able to see organisms that live in the open ocean just here at the end of the rocks. Um, so it's an incredibly uh, accessible area to see marine biodiversity. And it's also an extremely diverse habitat. So there are probably more species and more 
different families of organisms right behind me in this rocky inner tidal than in most other habitats you'd ever explore. And almost every time I go to the inner tidal, I find something new, something I've never seen before. So it's a really exciting area to explore. And uh, I'm so thrilled to have the chance to do it with you all. All right. Awesome, Joe. Well, we're excited too. So let's get going. Let's see what we can find. Yeah, let me turn around my camera here and... Uh... Okay, I think you can see what I'm seeing now. Yep. We're at the highest part of the inner tidal. And you can barely see any signs of marine life from where I'm standing here. But as we walk outward, you can actually see the first, the first seagrasses or the first uh, kelps and algaes. And these plants are actually marine organisms that live all the way up the shore right to where I right to where I'm standing here. And they're very well adapted to being out of the water because they probably only get wet once or twice in a given month. And one thing I want you to take notice of is how the, the ecosystem and community changes as I move from the upper inner tidal toward the lower inner tidal because there's very strong zonation in the rocky inner tidal. As I move further out here, you can see I'm getting to some mussels, starting to see some anemones, some fucus, some red algaes here, and continuing to move outward. You can see kind of how the community has already changed. A little bit more marine organisms here rather than terrestrial influenced. And it's a really unique environment because it's an environment with a lot of change. Every day, these things go from being underwater to above to, to being dry. Every day, they, they must experience huge changes in temperature and salinity. So these organisms are really tough and really well adapted to living in this harsh environment. And I'm going to try to highlight some of the adaptations as we move through the environment. So we're still moving through these big muscle beds here, but I'm coming now to the edge of the lower inner tidal. And you can see here that we are getting much more dominated by larger, larger uh, seaweeds. So let me step across here to get the lighting a bit better. Uh, we've got some feather boa kelp here. We've got some ulva here. We've got some uh, thalamus, uh, and we've got all sorts of red algaes, green algaes, eel grasses. So this area of the inner tidal is very dominated, dominated by plants uh, and algaes. But you'll find that these algaes, once they're out of the water, they'll dry up and almost become, you know, dried and papery. Uh, and that's just an adaptation. The moment that the tides come back up and they're underwater, they will flush back out and be healthy and happy. So these algaes are doing just fine, even though they are dry right now. Now, there are all sorts of life out in the inner tidal, and sometimes you have to be willing to look at really small things. So I'm just gonna zoom in here a little bit to let you see some of the scale of the organisms that we're looking at. In some of these cases, they are much smaller than your pinky fingernail. But there's a ton of biodiversity. And I'm going to show you more of this biodiversity as we move up away from the, the ocean here. So I'm getting back up and I'm going to walk over to these big mussel beds. Now these these are California mussels, and they are bivalves. So they are very similar to clams, but they're a little bit different. Uh, clams usually bury themselves. These are clearly attached onto the surface of the rocks, and they're filter feeders. Right now, you can see that the shells are, are closed up, 
But once these are underwater, they'll actually open up their shells and water will pass through and they'll filter feed out. Um, you'll also notice on these mussels that there are barnacles growing on them. So these mussels provide a lot of structure and habitat for other organisms in the inner tidal. And they're considered a foundational species because there are species, especially of worms, that will live underneath the mussel beds um, and won't be found anywhere else in, in, the, in the world except under the mussels. Um, also, if you are a seafood eater, these mussels are edible and delicious, uh, but not at this time of the year because of a harmful algal bloom. So if you're going to eat them, be sure you check and make sure that it's safe. Moving inward, I'm going to pause right here. And it may look like I'm just showing you a little patch of sand here. But actually, those are all anemones. And anemones are cnidarians. They're very similar to jellyfish. But these ones actually, instead of swimming in the ocean, they're attached to the rocks and they feed with tentacles just like uh, an earth, like uh, uh, jellyfish. But you can't see them right now because they're sucked inside the body to retain water because they're out of the water. Now, each one of these little circles that I'm looking at here is an individual organism. But what's interesting about this species of anemone, the aggregating anemone, is that they're clonal. So each one of these is an individual organism, but they're all genetically identical in this patch. And so one patch will compete with another patch. And this, everything in this area will be genetically identical. And everything in that area will be genetically identical. And they will have clone wars and try to digest the other colony. Um, so even though, th though they're slow moving, they're very exciting and pretty fun uh, species to track. Now, this is just one of the anemone species in the intertidal. And I'm hoping to show you a few more as we go along. Uh, and I'm hoping also to find a few that are open so that we can actually see the feeding tentacles. So let me get back up and move a little bit further down. Oh, great. We've got some big open anemones in this pool. Let me show you what a giant green anemone looks like. I don't know how well you can see it because of the ripples on the water, but that is a feeding giant green anemone. And you can see the long tentacles and the green oral disc. And now this is one of the largest anemone species here in the Rocky Intertidal. Uh, and it's about the size of a grapefruit, I would say. So this is a pretty big organism. Now, historically, Native Americans ate these, but I can't imagine eating one. They don't seem like they'd be very tasty to me. Now, I mentioned before that a lot of the species here are very small. And right here, I want to just show you the diversity of barnacles right at my feet. So barnacles are crustaceans, very much like shrimps but they put down a little housing around them, a calcareous housing, and, and then they filter feed with their feet. So right here, I have a pink acorn barnacle, and right here, I have a thalamus barnacle. And these ones here are balanus barnacles, and these here are gooseneck barnacles. So right here, Basically, within the size of, you know, my hand, I can find four species of barnacle. Um, and once you get into the inner tidal, you find diversity everywhere. You just have to clue into it. And the barnacles are pretty amazing, I would say. Let me get up and move on to another pool here. And Joe, are you seeing things, seeing everything all right and hearing me all right? Yeah, Joe, it's coming through very clear. 
perfect. I'm happy to hear that. Let me, so one of the areas I love to check out are cracks in the intertidal because they're usually a little wetter. So you have different species that hang out in them. And right here, I've got one of the highlights. This is a sea star, an ochre star. And in fact, there's more than one here. They're just underneath the plant. So I actually have three, four sea stars right here. These are all Pisaster ochreatus, the ochre sea star. And that's a top predator here in the intertidal. And the two color morphs, you see we have the orange one here and a purple one. They're the same species. It's just variation uh, within the species, just morphological variation. Now these are top predators in the intertidal and they feed on the mussels and determine where the mussel beds are actually going to be. And it's really great to see sea stars here in central California because just a few years ago, there was a terrible disease that came through and basically decimated the populations. And so it's really good to see that the sea stars are slightly recovering or starting to recover in central California. Another thing that I see right here is I've got two species of snail right on top of one another. This big one on the bottom is a black turban snail and it has three slipper snails on the shell. Now it's incredible how many different types of snails there are in the intertidal. But what's also incredible is that this species here, the black turban snail in the center, those, those snails can live to be a hundred years old and they don't ever get much bigger than that. And it's kind of incredible to have a few hitchhikers on you. It doesn't seem to bar, bother the turban snail. Now I'm gonna put him back down somewhere safe and move on. Ugh. Now here's something unlike anything that we've seen thus far. These, it almost looks like a sandcastle these are tube worm colonies. This is a colonial tube worm called Phragmatopoma California, the sandcastle worm or honeycomb worm. And you can see all the little individual holes and each hole is made out of sand. Each sand grain has been glued together in a perfect tube by a teeny tiny worm that lives inside of it. Now they they build these tubes to these tubes to protect themselves from the waves, and then when the tide comes in and the water is rushing over the tubes, they stick their tentacles out and filter feed out of the water. And so these are a really cool species of worm, uh, and they just build these enormous colonies throughout the intertidal. There are lots of other worms but these are the easiest ones to see. So I'm spending more time showing you those. Now, you never know what you'll find, but here is probably the most beautiful thing in the intertidal. And I'm gonna lay down on the rock so I can get close for you all to see it. That is an opalescent nudibranch. Now we are so lucky to find something like this. You hardly ever see them. And this is just a beautiful thing. This is a sea slug without a shell and it's a, it's a venomous sea slug. So if another species eats it, then that species will get sick. And, and this species of snail lets everybody know, hey, look at me, I'm bright and colorful because I'm poisonous so that no one will eat it. And you can see those, it almost looks like uh, flames on the back of it. Those are actually external gills. And that's the way that this little sea slug breathes. Now that is a really, really, really cool species to see. And I'm so thrilled 
and I feel so lucky that we got the chance to track this one down. I I hardly want to get up. That is awesome, Joe. It's coming in so clear. That is, to me, honestly, of all the things you could ever see in the inner title, this is the most beautiful species that we could have found. And so I'm just so happy. I don't ever want to get up. But I know that there are other things that I must show you. So take a screenshot if you want it. And uh, this is just so neat. I'm thrilled. But I'm going to get back up again and keep moving on so that we can get to some questions before we're done here. Oh, that's so neat. Now, I showed you the giant green anemone, but I'm going to show you another anemone right here. This species, oh, it's a little bit of a glare. Let me see if these will be better. These are sunburst anemones, and I don't know if you can see that the oral disc at the bottom has stripes radiating outward from the, the center. And it's another really cool, beautiful uh, anemone species here. Another very large anemone species. And I don't know if I can get this one to come through. It's actually a really beautiful anemone. So we've now seen three species of anemone, four species of barnacle. We've seen mussels. Let me see if I can track down some urchins. Where did my urchin hole go? Aha, here we are. Now I don't know how well you're going to be able to see them because they do kind of hide. But just, do you see those bright purple spines? Whoop, I just flipped my camera. Can you see those purple spines, Joe? Yeah, I can see them. They're just, just coming in, yep. They're just sticking out of holes because these urchins will carve holes out into the rock. And they'll carve holes into the rock over many generations. And just slowly with their spines, they'll wear holes into the rock. And eventually, they'll be stuck inside of inside of a hole for the rest of their life. It's kind of an incredible thing to find. A few nice anemones here. Let me see what I've got. Whew. It's getting a little bit more windy through here. Hey, Joe. Yes. Feel free to keep exploring a little bit just to see maybe something really cool will catch your eye questions while you're doing a little bit of exploring yeah i think that sounds great okay I, I, I can hear you well so i'll try to do a little bit more exploring and uh we'll then uh take questions and, and listen in and if i get too distracted with the the organisms then i'll sit down and get out of the wind and just focus on the questions all right sounds good so feel free to jump in if something catches your eye but let's Need a classroom. Let's go to Mrs. Paulson's class. Grade three is joining us in Camp Loops, British Columbia. Yeah, let me turn their microphone on. Hi, grade threes. Hi. All right. If you guys have a question for Joe about what he's up to, go ahead. Oh, I heard something. Can you get a little closer? Sorry, try one more time, or maybe your teacher can repeat it really close to the microphone. What is the biggest muscle that he has found? Perfect. So, Joe, what's oh. the biggest type of muscle? The biggest type of muscle here is the California muscle. But there are other species of muscle throughout the world that get much, much larger. The biggest muscle that you'll find here maybe would be six or seven inches long. But 
in other parts of the world, there are much larger mussel species than the ones we have here in Central California. All right, great questions. We'll swing back again, but let's go to another classroom. Um, let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Lynch. She's in her classes in Montana. It's a grade four group that's with her today. Let me see if we can turn their microphone on. How's it going, grade fours? All right, come nice and close so we can hear you. I heard something about anemones. Can you go a little bit louder? Do you see anemones? One more time. I'm just losing the very end. Uh, Joe, did you catch that? It's I, I didn't catch the whole thing. You see anemones sting people. Ah, there we go. We got it that time. Do they sting people? Um, wow. Babylon, maybe. Um, anemones don't really still sting people. They do try to, but your skin is, generally speaking, too thick to feel the sting. If you if you do stick like your tongue inside of an anemone, it would sting you, but not on your fingertips. Now, I want to jump in because I am shocked to have just found a, an abalone uh, right here on the inner tidal. And I don't know how well you can see it. It's right here. It's this snail. Now, that's a it, endangered species in California, and it is unbelievable to find a baby right here, uh, just so close to shore. So I'm really thrilled to have found that. And you're probably familiar with the shells of abalone because they're so beautiful. But to see a live individual is just incredible. And they're, they're a delicacy, aren't they? That's why they're under some pressure. They're a delicacy. And uh, the fishery has been entirely shut down in California because of overfishing. So it's good to see a, a juvenile here. Very cool. Uh, we're going to go to Illinois this time. We have some first and second graders uh, joining us from Fremont Elementary School. Let me turn their microphone on. How's it going, everyone? Hi. All right. Nice and clear. Right, go. Go ahead. What are the greatest dangers facing tide pools today? What is the greatest, the greatest danger for the great. tide pools? I think the greatest danger to tide pools and tide pool organisms is probably human exploitation. If you go to areas with fewer humans, like the area where I am at now, you'll see a lot more biodiversity than areas where there are a lot of people stepping on the organisms, pulling organism off, organisms off the rocks, etc. So while these species are pretty hardy and pretty well adapted to a difficult lifestyle, uh, human impacts will still have a big effect on these species. And I'm showing you right here this is a chitin, a California spiny chitin. This is a, a very ancient form of snail that instead of having just one shell, it has eight shells. Um, and you can see them here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then a surrounding mantle around it. And there's a lot of different chitin species here in Central California also. So getting back to the question, I would say, Probably the biggest threat is uh, is humans, unfortunately. All right, great question. We're going to visit uh, Mrs. Uh, McCreelis' group in grade, grade fours in San Antonio, Texas. Let me turn the microphone on. Hey, grade fours. Have you, have you ever done any experiments on the fish? Um. um I have not done experiments on the fish in the intertidal. 
I certainly do explore and, and catch fish in the intertidal. There are a lot of species of fish that live in here, but research that I do for my PhD is all done in, in Africa. And so I study mostly African fish. All right, let's jump to another classroom. Uh, this is Nordberg's class. Grade four or fives are joining us in Rainy River, Ontario, here in Canada. Let me turn your microphone on. How's it going, boys and girls? Oh, Joe, it looks like, is that a little hermit crab? Yeah, it's a little hermit crab. And it's wearing a brown tegula shell. I have a brown tegula shell on. Very cool. All right, go ahead with your question, Mrs. Nordberg's class. Why did you pick me? Are you asking Joe why he picked the job he does? Yeah. All right. Did you get that, Joe? I did. I love my job. I've got the coolest job in the world. I picked my job because I've always loved fish. And when I had the opportunity to travel to Africa, I fell in love with Africa. And so I wanted to find a way to do both ichthyology, studying fish, and also studying fish in Africa. So I feel really lucky. I, I feel like I've kind of fallen into my job and that my job picked me rather than I picked my job. But I'm still working to develop my career and uh, still hope to do more. So I, uh, I just feel very lucky to, have, to be doing what I'm doing. And actually, at this point, Joe, I'm going to turn the camera around so that I can uh, interact with you all a little bit better. All right. Sounds good to me. And boys and girls, if you want to learn a little bit more about what Joe does in the field, we did a hangout not too long ago, last month, uh, where he talked about what he does in Africa, looking and sampling lakes, uh, looking for species of fish and their biodiversity. So if you go to the National Geographic Education YouTube page, you can find Joe's video from last month and get a taste of just what he does uh, in Africa. So Joe, it's good to see your mug again. Thanks for that tour. Yeah, I uh, am so thrilled that we got to see so much cool stuff. Uh, I'm sorry that it was so windy and cold, but none of you had to deal with the wind and cold, so that's okay. Well, we appreciate the effort that you made to make it possible. Uh, let's meet uh, who have we met yet? Oh, Mrs. Kayser's group, grade fives in Freehold, New Jersey, are joining us. Um, let me turn their microphone on. Hey, New Jersey, how's it going? Um, how long did it take you to remember all the names of the species that you found today? <laughs> well, I've been lucky enough to teach in vertebrate zoology at UC Santa Cruz a few times, but it's taken my whole life, to be honest, and I'm still learning. One of the cool things about the intertidal is you find new things every time you're out there. And so I go out there and I find something new and I take a photograph and I ask everybody I know and someone will know. And then I just try my best to remember them. To be honest, my girlfriend remembers the, the species names much better than I do. All right, well, Joe, I have to say, uh, follow up on that question. That's it is pretty impressive. Your knowledge was is pretty good, and uh, knowing their names and, and their behaviors, that, that was tremendous. So you're a, a fountain of knowledge, so we appreciate being able to tap into that today. I'll tell you, this is just such a cool ecosystem and it's so much fun to explore that uh, it's really a joy to learn about it. And uh, I'm so thrilled to get to share it, you know, especially with people who aren't on the coast and don't have as, as good of access to it. So happy to give them a virtual tour. All right. Well, we probably have time for one or two more questions, and we'll let you get out of the wind. Um, boys and girls, if you have another question, give me a wave, and I'll keep an eye out for a classroom who's waving, and we'll get your question in. All right. So let's start off. Let's go back to Montana and see if we can grab another question from our group. 
What's the biggest kind of slug you've ever seen? I don't know. Uh, like, what's the biggest kind of slug you've ever seen? There are, there are, uh, there's a species called a sea hare, which is it's not a nudibranch like that, but it's very similar. And they will be the size of a football and probably weigh five pounds or so. I, 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 you find them every now and again in the intertidal, and they are remarkable and hilarious because they have, they have little antenna, but they are humongous, football sized and purple. All right. So, the size of a football, that's impressive. Yeah, if you ever need to find one, a California sea hare, they're bizarre. All right. This is. Let's have another question. Oh, is that us? Another question. Another question. Yes, go ahead. And she can just stand up right there. Just stand up there. Just stand up there. Quickly, quickly. Okay. What is your favorite sea animal? Oh, my favorite sea animal. That's a difficult question. I love them all, to be honest. I uh, I really like fish, but I also love, you know, the anemones, and I love the chitons, and I love the nudibranchs. You're asking me to choose between everything that I love, so I, I can't give you a good answer to that one. I think that's a pretty good answer. So, Joe, we've lost your video. Hopefully it's just temporary, but uh, we can still hear you. So let's try one more class. Let's go to our group in Illinois. Turn your microphone on. Illinois, come here, Evelyn. Nice and loud. Okay, so right here, and then can you see your face? Go ahead. What is the coolest picture you have ever found in a type? The coolest? There are a lot of really cool ones, I'll say. To be honest, that nudibranch that we just saw, the opalescent nudibranch, to me is about the coolest thing out there. But there are also some really cool things like flatworms, brittle stars. You know, there's just so many cool, weird things out there. Lots of eels, lots of fish, clingfish. Every time you're out there, you find something super neat. And I'm so happy that we found the nudibranch today because that to me is just about as good as it gets. All right, awesome. Well, Joe, I think we pushed our luck as far as it's gonna go today. We, we've lost video, we can still hear you, but I think now would be a good time uh, to wrap up for today. Well, um, thank you, Joe. I'm sorry that I lost video here at the end, but I'm glad that uh, we got the tour in and uh, that it, it's all worked out. I really think it's been fun. Nothing to apologize for, Joe. That was tremendous. Thank you so much. Um, the biodiversity is just beautiful. Um, I'm going to turn on the microphones and let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. Uh, great questions today, boys and girls. Um, and then we're going to sign off for today. So once again, Joe, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And thanks to all the right. students. And students. Wait, wait, wait. All right, boys and girls. Bye. All right, Joe, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget, we have a ton of more events coming up this week. So you need to tune in. Thank you.